the parent and family resource. Measuring where I am at in regards to love and truth. A discussion about how to measure where you are currently at in regards to love and truth. The process to get from denial to emotional awareness and how parents can make love-based change in the family. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia on the 23rd of March 2021 at 10 a.m. Hello and welcome to this Parenting Principles presentation. In this presentation we're just going to talk a little bit about becoming aware of where you are and what's really happening in your life like right at this moment. There's a process that we go through to become aware of what's actually going on in our life. And this, this can be applied to any, any area of your life and anything that's happening. So generally, we begin in denial. So let's, let's go one step even back. Let's say we're just like clueless. Sometimes we're not even, we don't even know we're in denial. We're just like trotting around in our life, doing whatever we do, living our life, not really thinking much about anything. And we're pretty much clueless. So we're cluelessly live it. So we're cluelessly like wandering around in our life, just you know, doing whatever we do, not really understanding why we do what we do, not even really think, actually not even thinking about like what we do, or, like why we even do what we do. Now, for me, what ended up happening is then I met Jesus and Mary, and I didn't even realise I was clueless. To be honest, I thought you know I was doing whatever I was. And they introduced me to some other possibilities. And they said, hey, there's some other possibilities. So I went from clueless to then hearing about, hey, there's some other possibilities that could happen. I never really considered there were other possibilities or other ways of living. I, I came from an environment, like a family environment, where I thought their way was the best way, that was the way to do it. When I say that, I didn't really feel that way but I paid lip service to that anyway. I just never stopped long enough to consider what I really thought or felt, and that was just where I was like, cluelessly going about my life. Then I heard there were other possibilities and, and other potentials in life and other ways of living and other theories and other ideas and all of these things, and my world was kind of thrown into a turmoil of like, wow, look at all these different things going on. I came to see certain things about myself that I'd never seen before. So you could say that I'd been in denial. I'd been in denial about how I felt, what I thought, about various beliefs I'd had. I didn't even, I didn't know myself. I didn't know what my real thoughts were, what, what I felt about any, any subject or situation. I wasn't being honest with myself about what had happened in my childhood to me or how I felt about it. I had created a facade or an image that I lived within, that I was comfortable with, that I wanted other people to believe and reinforce to me so that I didn't have to deal with a whole lot of stuff that I wanted to remain either clueless or in denial about. And so, so again, you can't realise you're in denial, really. And I, I don't feel without uh, often external feedback. I heard God's truth from Jesus and Mary, and I also got external feedback about myself specifically. This was caused me to have some intellectual awareness. So I'd gone from totally clueless, not even, th not literally, not thinking about anything other than, I suppose, daily activities, or I don't know, sometimes whatever I thought about at that time to then realize like getting sort of some, but I got some truth, some external truth, I had new things to consider. Then via some external feedback and receiving, like hearing about God's truth, I, you know, was highlighted to me, wow, you've been in denial about a lot of different things. So once I'd been given truth and received some feedback, now I had some intellectual understanding, like a thought, like sort of like, wow, okay, well, I didn't know this about myself or I hadn't considered this before. Or now I have something, you know, you know, I've got an awareness about that. Now, intellectual awareness is just, it's just like a thought. It's like here. It's like the, it, it doesn't sink down into your heart or penetrate your soul. It's just a new idea and a new concept. If you don't do anything about it, if you don't accept it into your soul in an emotional, pro, you know, experience, it's not a real, it's not real to you yet. So I heard a lot of things that, 
that I felt quite excited about or inspired by. And I heard things that sounded quite appealing, but I hadn't tried them yet, so I didn't know that they were real or, or what the outcome would be. So I had a concept. I had some thoughts about these things now, but there'd been no emotional experience and there'd been no soul-based change. So I still acted the same. So I still acted the same and there was no change in my life. Not real change. But I had, you know, I had some new, new, new ideas, which I quite like new ideas, so. Well, now intellectual awareness just remains intellectual unless you go into, uh, unless you gain emotional awareness. Emotional awareness is soul-based understanding. It means that it's in your heart, if you like, for another word. Heart, heart and soul, like we sort of have an expression of like when you have a heartfelt desire in the world or when you have a feeling in your heart, you know, it doesn't, that's not literally in your heart, it's really in your soul. So soul-based understanding or heartfelt desire or heartfelt feeling is the same as soul-based soul feeling or soul-based desire. So let's, let, I'll call it soul-based. So emotional awareness is you go through an emotional experience and as you go through the emotional experience you gain soul-based understanding. This is when you know for certain what's, uh, that, that, and, and there is true, real change. And you'll notice if you do this process and you get to emotional awareness and the soul-based change, that then a lot of things in your life change almost automatically and sometimes it's felt to me like magically but it's not magically it's that there was a whole process to get there. Now an emotional experience if you like or the level of emotion is interesting too. When we go through an emotional experience generally or emotional I suppose you could say it's a process it's really just like experiencing emotions but you basically go from clueless to realizing you're in denial to then often, you know, having um, you kind of, well, you've got a lot of addictions. When those addictions are no longer met and you're trying, you know, you're trying to get them, but when you stop the addictions, there's often a lot of rage and anger. So I'll say anger, but that can go from like a mere annoyance or frustration to intense fury. There's always like a spectrum of emotion. <laughs> And if you just even have the slightest like, little bit of frustration or annoyance, it's an indicator that there's some anger around there. And often some of the most things that I've just felt like, I'm just a little bit angry about that. Once I explore fur like, further, like feel, let myself just allow the emotion to be felt, found it's often far more intense than just a little bit of frustration. But once the anger, then we often have fear. Once you go through the fear, there's grief. And then once the grief is all released, then you can have like the truth on a subject or you can get new information on if you go through that whole process and every part of it is released like so that's up to you of how much emotional overwhelm I suppose you can well how much overwhelm you can um, you allow because emotion will flow if you allow it it's, it's very 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 simple it's just that we have feelings about all of these things and sometimes those feelings feel hard but they are just feelings, they do pass, they do go through you, and like they flow through you, and once they're out of you, they're gone. They're not, they're not there anymore, they're gone. Now, if you keep having the same feeling again and again and again, well, then obviously you haven't worked through it. Or sometimes we have what you could call emotions of self-deception. I kind of see the emotions of self-deception as really deny it, like you're wanting to avoid or, you know, kid yourself that it's something other than what it is. So they're still trying to deny their real emotion. But then, you know, this is sort of the process that, that we're all going to need to go through um, if we want to make soul-based changes. So go from clueless, and this is sort of when you don't know, so, so if this is the first time you've ever heard about divine truth, for instance, then this is sort of the process. You're probably clueless, you didn't have any idea even about it. Now, you know, here I am saying, hey, there's this thing called divine truth and I think it's really interesting and really good and, you know, you could try it and experiment and see how it works for you. Maybe that's the first time you've ever heard about it. So I've now opened up that there's a potential or a possibility of something different that you could try. 
So it's like the basic sort of pro, um, process that you go through each time, that you, and it's sort of like a cycle, I suppose. You, you go through one issue, and then, you know, you repeat it. So on one issue, you might have gone from clueless to, you know, and being in denial, or totally clueless, then, you know, you're in denial about something, and then you sort of realise that you're in denial. You gain some intellectual awareness and some, under, you know, sort of some theory and understanding, but no real change has happened in your life then it sort of like emotionally hits you. And that's a very different feeling than, than being intellectually aware. The emotional one is pretty... Um, until you have the experience, it's hard to understand. But once you have the emotional experience, you'll know the difference. And then with the emotional awareness, that's an emotional experience, and then you can gain a um, you know, heartfelt um, understanding. And then you can have the truth. Um, and let's say in this example about love or an aspect of love because there's a lot to learn about love like there's so many things about love and for me I've been a lot about learning about what love is not actually and I now can say like you know truth is always loving and telling the truth is a loving act and I can say things like that but in the past <laughs> I'd be like I don't know what love is like I don't know I kind of could identify more easily what love wasn't so, you know, love is not being pulled down and love is not, you know, doing this and love is not this. And that's, uh, it's sort of was like sort of via finding out what love wasn't that, that I began to understand what love is. I don't know how that would be for you, but that was my experience. Now, as I was talking about with the emotional um, awareness, we often go with our, just the feelings that we have and, and everything. We go sort of from clueless that we even have an emotion about that thing or we even have a feeling about it. And we're really in denial about everything. We can like be in a whole lot of self-deception emotions of thinking that we have different feelings than what we actually have. They're also denial tactics. Then we have a whole lot of emotional addictions. That is ways to avoid feeling our pain. They're just things that we do to avoid feeling something. So you might eat a lot um, and you eat a lot to feel better you know for a moment because obviously over time the law of compensation means that you get fatter and you put on weight and you've got more bulk to carry around and then you feel really uncomfortable and you don't feel very good about yourself and that's all the compensatory effects of not loving yourself to be to be honest so that's like an addiction or you might have other addictions such as like you might have a spiritual addictions where you're addicted to relationships with spirits because you get certain feelings from them or addictions with people because you get certain feelings from you. You might have friends who make you feel like you're superior to them because they feel a bit bad about themselves so they build you up and make you feel really good and you can like sort of be a bit like yeah I'm better than you and have a feeling that you're better than you. Or you may um, have an addiction to being inferior because that means that people you perceive that people aren't going to attack you and you feel uncomfortable with just letting yourself be yourself. There's all kinds of addictions that we have, and I'm just saying that you can have emotional or physical or spiritual, actually. So you can have emotional, physical, spiritual addictions. Now, when you give up your addictions, as you're giving them up, there's a process of anger that happens. There's a lot of angry, angriness and Often you have a big tantrum first, like that you don't even want to do it. So that's sort of a lot of anger comes up and just let that flow, let yourself experiencing that, go bash a punching bag, go bash a pillow, go scream into a pillow, whatever. Experiment with the way that you personally express emotion. Um, I had to do that. Like I would hear of people and how they expressed emotion and I would think, oh, I've got to do it the way that they're doing it. Honestly, what I found is figure it out for yourself, experiment, have a go, trial different things. Let yourself, you know, just let yourself feel. And, and because as adults, most of us have desensitized ourselves so severely that we're not really in tune with what we feel or even how to express what we feel. And sometimes it's pretty messy when we start. And, you know, if you start and you might say the wrong thing and you might do the wrong, you know, when I say that, I, I just know that I just started and I just let myself kind of, just feel what I felt and sometimes I act out it wasn't loving, it wasn't always responsible at the beginning. Don't recommend that, I don't. But what I'm saying is don't be afraid, like just do it. Like do it, have a go, do something different than what you've already done. Become sensitive to your own emotions. And you know, if you realize, oh, hold on, I wasn't loving to other people there with my emotion, I tried to dumped it on them. 
you know, learn from that experience and don't do it the next time. You know, or if you catch yourself always wanting to blame someone else for your emotion, or if you catch them wanting to commiserate and make you feel better or share in your emotion, oh yeah, those things aren't very loving. All right, just, you know, learn from them. And then, you know, modify and don't do them next time. If you've got friends who love you, I'm sure they'll let you know and say, well, now you want me to commiserate with you, but that wouldn't be actually, like, loving you. And I'm not going to. You need to go and feel about that. And then you might feel really angry. <laughs> Now, often anger uh, covers over fears that we have. Again, fear is just an emotion that needs to be felt. So then you feel through your fear. And once you feel through your fear, then there's a lot of sadness and grief. And then once you release that, that and if you do it like all of it fully, you can do like dribs and drabs. So you, and again, this is not like, when you're feeling, it's not like you go, oh, now I'm in the fear, and now I'm in the anger, and now I'm... It's like you can be just feeling your anger and then in a, you know 30 seconds or a minute you're, you're into your grief and you're having a big cry and as you're crying you might be feeling some fear as well like it's not just the sort of like you're only feeling one thing emotions aren't like that emotions flow and they change so a good example is little children they can go from laughing and being like really uh you know having a whole lot of fun and playing to just being on the ground sobbing their little hearts out and you know, and then they're up again, and then they're like, you know, really afraid about something, and then they have a big sob about it, and then they move on, and then, you know, they, they're sort of, if left to their own devices, they're just doing this, you know, and also then they've got all these pleasurable emotions that they're experiencing too, like they're happy, and they're enjoying things, and they're excited, and they're, you know, they've got wonder, and there's all this other stuff that's going on as well. But if you have the courage, you know, often with, with, as we get to be adults, we've put addictions over our emotions so that we don't feel them, just to suppress them. We often have a big facade on it, so then we like, that's like denial. Facades are, are really damaging to your progress, to your spiritual progress, because you're not being honest and you're not being you. It's far better to be yourself, whether or not that's loving. You're just better to be yourself because then you can work with that. But if you're lying to yourself, it's the worst thing you can do because you can't ever change. And God can work with us when we're honest and open and transparent, but not when we're faking it and pretending to be something we're not. So I really encourage you to just be yourself. Um, not judge yourself, just let yourself be it. You can measure where you're at right now and you know, you might not be a very loving person right now. When I first heard Divine Truth, I wasn't a very loving person. I just wanted to be loved. Um, now I feel like I'm learning a lot about love. I have a growing desire to actually love others, which is a very nice feeling and a, a much uh, like a shift that has happened in me because, yeah, I'm not, I didn't always really ha I didn't have that desire. And the cha and there's a lovely you know change and you learn a lot. And I feel like that's what. God's intended for us is to learn about love and to feel by actually feeling what it feels like when we're being unloving and being unkind to others and you know when we harm others and, and things like that because there's so much pain in it when you truly feel about it you don't ever want to do it again so it's worth it's worth coming to know and when I say know yourself I mean like emotionally know yourself and understand yourself you know, it's one thing to go, oh, well, I'm like this and I'm like that, and they're all just head thoughts. It's another thing to really know and understand what is in your soul and to measure your, you know, it's kind of where, where you're at in the sense of do you want to love or not. You need to find out where you're at before you can make any changes. And this is part of the way to find out where you're at. You know, and, and you can look at different issues and different subjects. And on some subjects for me, I'm in denial. Like I'm not even really aware that I've got them yet. You know, and what I notice is as I go through this process and I go through emotion, emotion, you know, and I get sort of to a grieving point and I release certain things, often a whole new layer of things is then exposed to me that I couldn't see before. Sometimes about the same subject, sometimes about a completely different subject. And so there's just like these layers of understanding as you understand more and more and more. And so this is just like an ongoing process that just keeps um, happening. So the more, the more you can just let yourself be your emotional self, the easier your life's going to become. That's been my experience. So let's apply this to parenting. 
Let's take an example and look at what it might look like. So, so applying this to, par to parenting. Let's take what does it mean to be a loving parent? Well, maybe you're clueless about that. I don't know. I know when before I had children, I had no idea what it meant to be a loving parent. I had some like um, ideals or some concepts, I suppose, of what a parent did. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, of course I'd be a loving parent. Of course, you know, of course I'm going to be great. So I'm clueless and in denial <laughs> about certain things because I'm not even seeing myself as I really am. I haven't even looked at myself as I really am. I don't even see whether I, I don't really, I'm clueless about what love is. So th this question actually covers a lot of areas in it. One is, you know, one, what does loving mean? Two, what is, what, is, what is the role of a parent and how do you measure that? If you're listening to this Parenting Principles program, I'm stating that a loving parent is, I'm measuring that from God's perspective of what God sees as a loving parent. And that's what I've heard from the teachings of Jesus and Mary, also known as A.J. Miller and Mary Luck, and from what they've heard. And then with my beginnings of experimenting for myself and um, finding out via my own experience and also from, you know, via the conscience with God about what, what is a loving parent? What does that mean? So this question has two things. One is, you know, where am I at with what do I understand about what a parent is from God's perspective and, you know, the role of a parent and also what is loving from God's perspective? So let's say, you know, it's the first time you've ever heard about it. So you've been clueless. And now I've just opened up an idea of, hold on, there's such a thing as a loving parent. Well, what does that mean? There's a new possibility. I could actually parent from God's perspective and be like our parent God. I could actually understand some things. And, you know, I could be this, I could actually love children without demanding of them. There's all these different concepts. And if you've listened to some of the preliminary videos, then you might have had a lot of like sort of moments of going, wow, I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't even know that I could do that. I didn't even think about even being a parent. I've just been going about my everyday life thinking that, yep, one day I'll have kids and I'll just know what to do. I'm just telling you, you don't just know what to do. All of these people who just are like, yeah, they're just a natural born parent. No, it's not like that. Never is. You know, you have these people who just take to it like a duck to water. Now, <laughs> when I say that, it doesn't mean that, like, there is instinct in us. And also, some of us have, um, you know, we have different, we've had different experiences and we've had a unique upbringing and we have different beliefs and different understandings about things. And what I've observed in families is sometimes parents love little tiny babies. Sometimes they really love toddler stage and sometimes they love teenagers and sometimes they don't love any of it. You know, there's different different feelings and different different things. Some people also trust their their bodies more and they also trust that they'll figure it out. Like they have more of an experimental attitude and they're more relaxed with what's happening and, you know, new things going on and they don't need to be in control or they don't have, you know, control issues around kids or like there's a lot of different factors and each of us have different things going on. So for every single one of you who's viewing this and you're going to have a unique cohort of, uh, you know, things that you bring to being a parent. But for the sake of this example, we're saying, you know, we go from clueless and we're applying it to parenting. So what does it mean to be a loving parent? Well, one, we're clueless about love. I'm saying, okay, we're clueless about love. We're clueless about what it really means, like the role of a parent from God's perspective. So you've been given some, in, you know, possibilities. Now we could also now find out, say, the denial part. We could say, oh, well, I know what it is to be loving. Oh, I don't need any to do any of those, you know, I don't need any information or I don't need an education in love. I already know what it means to be loving. Honestly, if anyone says that, I just reckon you're in denial because the world's way is so screwed up, for want of a better, better word. What we think is love is is so often not loving like it's all about us getting our addictions met and us getting certain like avoiding feeling certain feelings now sometimes there are um there are moments or 
some areas where we have more of a feeling of love or kindness or openness or generosity in some areas. And that just depends on, on various things and also our own desire. You know, sometimes we've been through various things as we've been growing up and sometimes we do have a real love for, for say, children in this, this instant and before we become a parent. Some of us don't. I was one who didn't, like, I really enjoyed being around children and I did have some sense of love for children, but not a pure one. It was what I could get out of the situation, how I felt when I was in the situation. And this is where the denial part comes in, is to be very honest with yourself about what you really feel about parenting and about love. And if we're using this example. So this is where you can become honest and you can start to see all of the things that you truly believe about love and all of the things that you really feel about being a parent. Now as you go through that process, now depending on, on like if you're sensitive to God's laws and that's a process that you can become or you've got people who know more about love than you do or you might have listened to the divine truth teachings and done the assistance group. So then you get some theory, some intellectual understand awareness, some concepts and thoughts about what love is and about what being a, a parent, you know, what the role of a parent is from God's perspective. So now you have some intellectual understanding. To me, that's the fastest way to grow. If you find someone who knows more about, you know, and, and they have a loving feeling in them and they know more about truth than you do and they know more about love than you do, honestly, if you can be open to receiving feedback, it's the fastest, most rapid way to grow. Now again, you can do that with a relationship with God. You're going to need to go through a process in order to be open enough to hear God and to receive God's love. And that's just, again, need to go through, you know, an intellectual awareness that it's possible and then an emotional feeling and, you know, emotional awareness of, you know, of where, where you're at with that and whether you really truly desire it or not. Work through all of the emotions about how you feel. So you need to go, you know, through all of these things. You might even be in denial that there is a God and you don't want to believe that yet. So you need to work through that. Then you have like a whole lot of addictions possibly that, you know, you actually want people's love, not God's love. And you feel like if you have a relationship with God, then you're not going to have any relationship with people. I don't, I don't know. You might have all, honestly, there'd be just so many different things for each individual. So you just need to feel about that for yourself. Then you might have some really big anger about having a relationship with God and, and about God, in, you know, about how God's let you down or no one taught you about God or they didn't, you know, uh, tell you that there was this amazingly loving parent who adored us and who could have like you know we could have been having a relationship for many many years um you might just feel like a whole lot of other feelings about about god in general it depends i suppose on your religious background or whether you're atheist or you know how hurt you've been by people in religion or you know whether you've you've had a dogmatic experience about it maybe you've had no experience about it and you don't really know or you have you know you're more into the new age kind of ideas and have sort of false beliefs about that you are God because by the way you're not um, God is an entity that's outside of us and is is not in you you can receive God's love and that means that you can receive you know you can end up coming to a point of being at one with God where you love as God loves and you can understand God's love and how God's love and what that feels like and you can then express your love to others and actually love as God loves others as well and be an example of, of, what it, of what that means. Obviously not to the degree of God because God's an infinite being who, you know, is, is, I can't even imagine, honestly, like it blows my mind. So, yeah, you keep going through a process and you may have fears about God and what that might mean and, you know, there's all kinds of feelings you're going to have. And then you may come to a lot of grief about, you know, not having a relationship with God and what does that mean and, you know, why didn't you have one and just the sadness that maybe you weren't introduced or you felt like something's missing or maybe you had, had a relationship with God when you were a very, very tiny person and you felt there was something but that's sort of been squashed down. There could be all kinds of different things that you're going to go through but this is just like a, I suppose it's like laying out a bit of a process to become familiar with of that, you know, these are certain things you're going to go through. And when I've written down here, anger, fear, grief, 
there's so many feelings that are not listed there. Um, it's not just anger, fear, grief. You can have all kinds of different feelings that come, come. You've got so many different feelings inside you and it's not just that simplistic or basic. It's quite complex. Just trying to bring in concepts, bring in like principles so that at least you can get this intellectual awareness uh, of the idea that it's possible. And then going to be the emotional awareness that actually makes changes in your life. It's the emotional awareness that actually um, comes so that you will understand God's truth on any matter. If you do not go through the soul-based understanding, you do not know. You just don't. And that goes for anything. If you don't understand it in your soul, you don't understand it. So you can't have this, oh, I intellectually get it. It's not like that. You either get it or you don't. It's like with love. You either love or you don't love. And if you love, then it's a feeling in your soul and you're consistent because love is consistent. And it will happen you know, every time. And no matter what pressure you're under, you, if you genuinely have that truth in your heart, you know, say about love, you will act in a loving manner every single time consistently with every single person on every single like subject that you have that feeling. So if you were at one with God, you would act in harmony with love under all circumstances with all people, no matter what was happening to you and no matter what was happening with them. Now, when you don't love as God loves yet, so you're not at one with God, then there's some places like um, that you find out and you go through this whole process and you find out the truth about a subject or you come to love in certain areas and on those issues you don't have to try anymore it's just automatic response that you have but then there'll be other areas and subjects that you may not love in yet and under those you won't act automatically in a loving in a loving manner you may end up you know being quite unkind or uh, um, not doing it now that's where the intellectual awareness is and that's what's so lovely about observing people's you know, interactions and behavior with yourself and with others. Because as you um, observe them and you, you can see what motivates a person and you can come to be sensitive to their intentions and their motivations and th what they really feel and think. And it's like someone saying, oh, I love you. I love you just so much. And then they ignore you every time you're out in public. I don't know, that doesn't seem very loving to me. <laughs> it's like, if you really loved a person, you'd be the same in public or in private. Another example is with children, they may, you know, behave or act out and, you know, you want to punish them every time. So you don't love yet on that, on that subject and in that area with your child. Because if you truly loved your child, you'd want to educate them, not punish them. You'd correct anything that was out of harmony with love. But again, are you correcting it because you think it's wrong or are you correcting it because it's not in harmony with love? And this is something that, as a parent, if we don't have an education in love and we don't understand what love is or what love does and how love acts and what you do in those situations, which has to be a soul-based understanding for it to be anything real, if we don't do that, then how can we teach, you know, how can we teach our children? So on some subjects we may love and on other subjects or areas we might not love while we are not yet at one and perfected in love as God loves. And these are just areas to find out. A lot of this Parenting Principles program is about discovering yourself and where you're at. And the whole program revolves around you making change, not in a narcissistic way and not all about you. It's about do you desire to love? So you could ask that in a first person of, do I desire to love? Do I want to love? And if you don't, you're not going to do anything. Everything that I say in this program, you'll either probably have a, a negative reaction to or you disagree with or you, you'll have some excuse that you won't want to do it. If you grow a desire to love or, or it appeals to you or you feel a bit inspired by some of the things that I say, give it a go. You know, like again, I do suggest going to the source of the information, which is divinetruth.com. So many wonderful, wonderful things to learn on that site um, and that Jesus and Mary have shared. If you don't want to love, you're not going to have any motivation to make any, any shifts or changes. What I observe in the world is that it's our lack of desire to love. It's our, basically our selfish desire to want our addictions met and want to 
you know, be loved rather than to love that is causing most of the pain and suffering on our earth. And that goes for both interpersonal relationships with other people, partner relationships, our relationships with children, our relationships with friends, not dealing with our emotions and the way that we truly feel, so being dishonest about our feelings and then blaming others rather than taking personal responsibility, which is an act of love, and feeling our own emotions, which is an act of love. Actually feeling how you feel is loving in a self-responsible manner. You know, not feeling our fear and not dealing with all of, like, with fears about all kinds of things. Fear creates war, fear creates so much pain, so much hurt and heartache and trouble and disintegrates relationships. And if we're not going to work through that, then we don't want to love. And if you don't want to love enough, in the sense of if you don't have a strong, passionate desire to love others and yourself and the environment and, and God, you're not going to do any of those things. There has to be a passionate desire to want to do it. It's not going to happen unless you want it. You are the lead character in your story, if you like. Well, your soul is, so you and your soulmate. But if you don't know your soulmate yet, you're the lead character in your story. You can choose to love or you can choose not to love. If you choose not to love, you're now in disharmony with God's laws. That means there's going to be more pain and suffering in your life. If you choose to love, there's going to be more pleasure and more, more freedoms and you're going to find out more things. There'll be more opportunities will open up. It's a completely different um, road that you choose to take. But it is a choice that individually you'll need to make for yourself. No one can force you to change. No one can force you to love. Love is a gift. You can't demand love. And this is something, you know, just as an aside with children, often parents are very demanding of children, super demanding. And they expect things from children and they want things from children and they want the child to love them. And when a child doesn't or when they don't, then, the, um, you know, the parent or the adult gets very angry and upset at the child. That's just not taking responsibility for your own personal and emotional, exp you know, expression and blaming someone else for your feelings. I've found that every time that I got angry with the children, it was never to do with the children. Their behavior just exposed in me certain emotions that I had. And the first you know, often the first um, emotion that I go to is anger because that felt a lot more powerful than the grief or helplessness or hopelessness or feeling like I couldn't do things. Or Every time I was angry, I learned over time, wow, that anger hurt, you know, it actually harms another, other people if you directly take your rage out on another person and you blame and you punish them. That actually is direct, is so unloving to the person. And that rage is absorbed by the child into their, um, you know, into their soul. And often, if you notice, I've noticed this at schools with teachers as well, there's often using like behavior management strategies of raging at children, depending on, on the, like children are kind of getting a better normalized by it and it's not working so much. But it really just instills fear in the children and they respond out of fear, not because they want to learn or because they, they you know, they want to love or do the right thing. And parents are the same. Often children are very afraid of their parents. You can have, I observe that a lot of the opposite in this day and age as well, where actually the children feel super entitled because their parents have taught them to be completely entitled and taught them that they can have whatever they want, which is also not an act of love towards a child. Both of those things are not loving. The children are not responsible for your emotional response or your feelings or your actions. So when someone says, well, you deserve that, or, you know, when a parent says to a child, well, you deserve that, or you know, you, you know what you did, or I just did it for your own good, or, you know, I often, I just think all of those things are completely out of harmony with love, and it's parents not taking responsibility for their emotions or the feelings that they have going on. If you were, if you wanted to love, you would, you, you know, you may have a response, so something might happen, the behavior might happen. You know, for instance, you might be at the supermarket and a kid pulls off, you know, stuff off the, off the shelf and your immediate feeling is like you want to shut down the child, stop them doing what they're doing. Now, instead of acting on that, feel what you really feel. Do you feel really embarrassed? Do you feel ashamed? Do you feel worried that the rest of the people in the supermarket are going to judge you? 
Are you then concerned that your child's going to chuck a tantrum and you're not going to be able to do anything about it? You know, are you worried that you're now going to have to pay for the goods that have now been like destroyed by your child? You know, what do you feel? If you just own and feel what you really feel rather than punishing the child for, for, for just being a reflector and trying to help you to learn more about love, which is what the attraction is for. That's the perfect attraction for you to learn something about love and truth. Perfect. And for each parent, you'll notice like if you start discussing between families about behaviours in children, you'll notice some similarities and some differences. You'll also notice that both parents have different attractions. So something that I noticed is that um, our children reflect to me much more, they're much more passive aggressive with me in the sense of if they're angry and upset and they project at me and there's the sort of the feeling that comes out to me is like, you're a bad mum and you're terrible and you're hurting us and you're mean. And that to me is like, I just want to like do whatever they want to get away from that feeling. That's what it's been like in the past. Whereas with their dad, they're often like more overt and more verbal and more forceful and and that to him is, is what um, he feels more uncomfortable with. So even in one single family, depending on the injuries of the parents and depending on the unhealed emotions in us and you know, the law of attraction will be perfect to bring you the very, very, very best, perfect, most kind, most gentle way to learn about love. Now you might be like when you hear me say that, go, doesn't feel very gentle, like seriously, what's gentle about what's happening in my house? That's how I felt, <laughs> you know, and, and there, might, there might be, your kids might be physically violent to each other, your kids might be being physically violent to you. Let's take that as an example. And you'll be like, yeah, what's gentle about that? That is because where you are at right now, that, you know, the fact that if your kids are bashing each other or hitting you, there's obviously been a number of years of things happening because a newborn baby obviously can't hit you. But there's been something happening in the house for it to get and escalate to that, to that point. Now, if you dealt with whatever was happened the very, very first time one of your children punched each other or the very first time they punched you, if you dealt in a loving manner with that issue, which would have been to restrict the child in order to show them about to make transparent God's laws that violence towards another person is not an act of love so you need to restrict them and you'd also work through the issue so say let's take an example that you know your son hits you um, as the mother and you're hit by the, your son then you need to restrict your son in order for them to learn and make transparent God's laws and and also make it very explicit that by breaking God's laws there's going to be pain and suffering. And I, that doesn't mean that you create pain and suffering but to try and help the child to become sensitive to the feelings inside of them uh, themselves so that they can connect with the conscience and directly with God so that they can get a, a sense of like oh hold on when I hurt when I hit somebody you know well that doesn't feel very good. Now, if you just angrily retaliate and shut that, you know, like just attack the child back, they just learn, well, if I, if I need, you know, if I attack, then, you know, I'm just going to get punched back kind of thing. They'll make different choices as they go along. But if you really loved, you'd try and educate the child, but you'd also look at yourself and you'd look at yourself first. So though you might restrict the child, simultaneously, you'd be looking at, wow, why am I open to physical violence from a man? Like, why do I accept that? What in me is open to that? You know, what's going on? And you'd need to heal all of the issues and the feelings of, of why, you know, that was the, the case. And find your, you know, motivations of why you accepted it. And, I, you know, do you have fears about it? Or, you know, have you been harmed in the past? And have you not dealt through and worked through your sadness about, about what's happened? You know, that's sort of what you do. Now, if there was a girl hitting the boy and the boy just does nothing, you know, and that might happen between siblings or little girl goes and smacks dad, now then there might be a whole lot of other things going on. Each scenario is completely different and for each person it's going to be unique and it's going to be different and the same actions, as I've said before, the same actions may indicate a different causal problem. The only way to find out is going to be going through an emotional process of feeling and coming to a soul-based understanding of what is actually happening. So that's your emotional awareness. So there's quite a lot in that to unpack. I've used a few examples, some of them might not apply to you, but you can still apply the principles and sort of the method, you know, to, to, to anything that's happening in your parenting. We often go from clueless to them being in denial, 
then there's some intellectual awareness when we hear some truth or some other possibilities that are happening. Then there's emotional awareness, that's your soul-based awareness. Remember, intellectual awareness, there's no real change. It's not in your heart or your soul. Nothing's really different. You're going to just be taking physical actions. Emotional awareness, that's where you go through a, a process to, to become emotionally aware. And, you know, you may become like a little bit emotionally aware and then more and more and more over time as you learn more and you, you release more error or, you know, you, the more that you release of false beliefs or things that are out of harmony with what God, you know, with God's truth and the more you desire to receive how, you know, God's truth and that's how God feels about things, you know, the more that you're going to come to understand. I talked about in the partner relationships and parenting presentation just about how if you're in your family, if you're aiming for God's truth and to find God's truth, how wonderful that is as a, a place to, you know, to aim for because then you give up being, having to be right, you give up being, having to have it your way. If you're really seeking God's truth, you'll give up blaming the other party or yourself and you'll just seek for what's the truth here and what is there for both parties to learn or all parties in a family to learn from this experience. Children, you know, as they get older, these same principles can be applied to your relationship with your children. When they're very, very small, they're just reflecting things and your only real responsibility, I feel, as a parent is just to make God's laws explicit in the sense of if you break them, there's pain and suffering. If you abide by them and you live in harmony with them, then there's a lot of rewards and opportunities that open up. Now, when I say make explicit, I just want to be very clear about this. That doesn't mean that you cause or create pain and suffering in a child to show them God's laws because that's not showing them God's laws. That would be you demonstrating that, you know, if you don't do what mum or dad think is right, they're going to hurt you. And God doesn't ever hurt us. God just gently, like, well, God has firm, firm laws in place that are continuously directing us. And it's just a matter, like the amount of sensitivity we have to the laws of whether we feel that or not. Now, children, when they're, when they're small, like, they have a feeling and a sense of what is right and wrong. Children generally have a feeling when they're small of, of what's sort of more loving and what's not. Uh, unless they've been very, very damaged, they often, you know, can feel like they see things happening, like say if an animal gets hurt, they like, that's not, they don't, they don't like that, they respond to that. In, in quite a strong manner of like, no, this is not, not nice or not, not, this is not loving or this isn't kind. And they can see that also with people, or like with people, depending on what their injuries are, because depending on, you know, the allowance or the openings in the parents, it's going to depend what it is. But if you can just start to make it transparent to a child by discussions and just, if you can make things very clear to a child, often asking them why now if they're very, very tiny, obviously they're just they're just reflecting you at that point so you're the one who needs the education and who's getting it as they get a little bit older you know when they're little toddlers and things like that you there's lo there's very like sort of kind ways that you can help a child to see uh, that something is loving or unloving so for instance even a very young child like a two or three year old you know you could teach them about self-responsibility and cleaning up by the fact that if they don't clean their dish and and you know look after it, it's dirty the next time and then that's not very nice and then it gets mold and you know all these kind of things on it and then they can learn oh hold on it's loving to clean up after myself and look after myself the same you know as they get a little bit older if they don't want to you know if they get all grubby and then they don't want to actually clean their clothes well then they've got no clean clothes to wear most children wouldn't like that, you know, they don't, they don't, it's not nice to feel all grubby and if you start early enough then your children will come to be more sensitive to, to what, what is loving and what is not, not loving and far more rapidly. So my point was that you're not there to punish or discipline the child into sort of submission or to say, yes, I'm going to create pain and suffering if you break God's laws, because you're now breaking God's laws. If you inflict pain and suffering on someone else, that's not a loving act. A loving act would be to educate and to, you know, make, make clear. You'd be very firm, but it's also kind and, and loving and also depending on how educated they are. Something with children is I find that a lot of parents have an expectation that children should know how to do things before they've even been educated in how to do them. 
And a lot of times parents don't even know how to do certain things, physically or emotionally or spiritually, yet they have a demand or an expectation or a feeling that, oh, the child should do that, or, you know, I want the child to do better than I am, or, you know, they have these demands on the child. And that's something for, you know, you to look at and you to work through, because that's, you know, that isn't an act of love to demand something from a child that you wouldn't actually do yourself. So there's a lot to learn about love and about truth and about God's laws. And if we don't know what God's laws are, then you can't really make them explicit to children because you don't know yet. So again, the principle is that if you don't know something, you can't teach it. Also, it's the soul conversation that is the most powerful conversation. It's what you feel, what you really think, what's actually in your soul, what you is, is is what children are going to pick up on. Unless they're taught otherwise to believe the facade or the words, they're going to respond to the soul conversation. The soul conversation is what's really going on inside you and inside them. And that's what the response is. So you can say the words, you can try and, like you can use words to try and make, make people like believe something, but then you're just an intellectual area. There's no change with words. Words, words are just cheap and they're empty and there's no real substance in them unless they match up with what the soul feels and what you truly feel. So if your thoughts, actions and feelings all match up, that's very, very powerful and children will respond then and it will work. But if you're finding in your family dynamic that your partner or your children are not responding to what you're saying, I would look at, well, hold on, what do I really feel? Or what is the message? Like, so you might even be saying, no, that's not okay. But inside of you, you may have a whole lot of feelings of like, ah, oh, you know, you're afraid of, uh, you know, you might not be firm for that issue of love. You know, you might actually feel like, no, actually that, it, you know, I'm okay with that under this circumstance, or I'm okay with that under certain circumstances, or I'm okay if they do that to me. So the soul conversation is the most important conversation. And that is, you know, and that, that's a real conversation and that's the one. So the more that you can come to know what you, what you really think, what you really feel, the better it's going to be. And also it's going to make life smoother with your children because they're going to respond to that conversation more than they are to your words. So in summary, there's just like the process that we go through in order to come to understand new truths or to come to an understanding about um, our, we have you know, emotional awareness and to make real change in our families is we generally go from like clueless and knowing nothing to then maybe hearing something and it opens up new possibilities or ideas or potentials and opportunities. We might feel very inspired at that point. We may find that we've been in denial about a whole lot of things and then via hearing truth and external feedback then get an intellectual awareness or understanding about something and we can come to understand it more. But that's just a surface thing. We'll still take the same actions. We'd have to try very hard if we were trying to make changes. And then it goes into emotional awareness or emotional understanding. That's a soul-based understanding. That's an emotional process to go through that and work through it. Also spoke about the actual emotional experience and how you can go sort of being from insensitive and clueless to you know and then being denial or just being in denial about things. Then you can have a lot of self-deception emotions where you want to believe certain things about yourself but they're not really true. Then we have like a layer of addictions. They're all things that we've created in order to avoid certain feelings because we don't want to feel them. And then we go through sort of basically anger, fear, um, grief and then we can accept new truth or you know we come to more awareness about what our issue was about. You have to have a desire if you want to receive new truth from God. Without a desire you can still work through the emotions and even get rid of the cause but you may not get new truth um, you know it depend, depends on what situation you are. You'd, if you worked through all that you'd obviously come to understand a lot more about yourself so you'd find out more truth about yourself. And then you come to a place where you have more understanding about what that issue or situation was all about. And also, if you have a desire, you can receive new truth and understand more about what's, what's happening uh, for your personal, for you in your personal life, um, between your partner and your family, between what happened with your parents. If you remember that you, as the parents, 
uh, the ones that are being reflected and that UK, you know, what your past is going to dictate your future until you make certain changes and that's the soul-based emotional change. Once you make those, then you've got a, like all kinds of possibilities and open up if, if you actually change your soul, you know, your condition. We have you know, our will and that's sort of where we're at right now. And then we have our desire or our aspiration. And that's where we're headed in the future. And that can be in the direction of love and understanding more about love and coming to know and understand more about love. Or it can be in the direction of more sin and more addiction and more selfishness and more pain and suffering. You know, you can have desires in both directions. And that's a choice that we make. Something that, again, you learn a lot about God's laws either direction and it's worth developing, you know, the aspiration or the desire and experimenting with that because you'll find out a lot. Even if you head in the, you know, sinful direction, I don't recommend it, I don't. But say if you've, if you've led a life where you've been down there, you, you know, some people have very, very strong desires and in that direction and once they realise they can turn themselves away and head in a positive direction. I have this feeling that if people just, you know, there's a lot of people who have some pretty strong desires and are doing a lot of things in the world and if they actually just put it to, you know, good or towards love, what potential there is for, for wonderful things to happen in the world. Again, though, it has to come from our own heartfelt desire in order to change it and want to do that. And that's the provision we've been given by God in order to express ourselves and make choices, have a free will decision of what we do. If you want to love, it's a choice that you can make. And if you don't want to love, figure out why. Why don't you want to love? What's the motivation there? If you can find the reasons and your motivation, then there's the possibility to change. If you don't find the reasons and you don't understand the possibilities, it makes it a lot harder. That concludes this presentation on gaining, you know, on coming to understand new truths or gaining emotional awareness about a subject in your life. And uh, it's quite a simple process. It's not really as defined as it is on the whiteboard. The process it is not an intellectual one, so it sort of just happens and you don't really think about it in these steps but just to conceptualize what's going to happen. My suggestion is just to feel. The more you feel and just get used to feeling whatever you feel, all of these things will happen in more of a natural process. Um, you know, if you think too much about them, you can get into your head and then avoid the feeling, which is why you want to get into your head in the first place. The more you can work through any impediment you have to letting yourself just feel how you feel, and you know any impediment that you have to growing a desire and developing a desire to have a relationship with God and have a relationship and to come to understand yourself and your soulmate and to any impediment that you have to loving others you know once you sort of get over all those things then things become a lot smoother that takes some courage at first and also a desire to want to love a key question in this resource is, is, do I want to love? And what, what does love do? You know, what is love? And part of this is gaining an education in love. Having children is an opportunity to find out what love does. The divine teachings of divine truth, they have a whole assistance group on gaining an education in love. And that's, they've, that's not even finished or complete yet. So they're up to understanding like sin and its causes. One of the key questions to ask yourself and to, to reflect upon is what does love, would love do under whatever situation, apply it to any situation, and then you can start to learn more about love. And another key question is, do I want to love? Um, if you don't want to love, you're not going to make any changes and you'll never get to the emotional soul-based change because you won't be motivated to do it. You'll, you'll just remain the same. Love is a great motivator. Pain and suffering also is a motivator, but pain and suffering only motivates to a particular level in the sense of when you're no longer in pain and suffering, then you'll stop at that point. Whereas if love motivates you, you're likely to do far more than you ever thought possible because your desire to love will pull you through those things. When I say, when I speak about love, I'm also referring to truth. Love and truth go together. They're like bound, they're, they're, a, they're a couple, <laughs> you can't separate them. And so when I refer to love, I'm also talking about truth. 
truth is also a great motivator and can pull you through things. So for me personally, truth is something that I really desire to know and that pulls me through a lot of other things, even when I find sometimes things difficult or, or tricky. So love and truth can be a great motivator for personal change. I'll see you next time.